My name is Juan Vasquez and I'll be doing a presentation here on Groovy. I'm a software engineer here with a local utility. And uh, we'll be going over some, I'll do some introductory syntax stuff that maybe some folks aren't uh, aware of if they've done some Java programming. And then I'll start going into some meta object programming as well with Groovy. So we'll have a few, a few advanced topics I think that folks will enjoy um, watching, I hope. So these are some of the tools that I use pretty much on a daily basis. Um, if you're, if you got your, anyone's got computers here that want to run those, uh, GVM, it's the Groovy version management tool. Um, I'll open that up here. This is really, really nice. It gives you a command line to um, pull in your various libraries. So if I did, uh, is that in the preferences? Oh, okay. That'll work. Is that good? Yep. Good. I don't know if that's going to probably needs to be bigger to show up on the camera. I do a little bigger. Yeah. All right. Let's do this. I think I lost my. Okay. So GVM, um, you you go ahead and. Go to the site, download it, and then once you have it in, um, it, it can give you a bunch of... You can download your Grails installs and you can switch between them very easily on the command line so you can switch your environment. This was a pain previously, previous to this. Um, if you didn't have an IDE that would store the Grails version that you were using. So uh, before I use um, IntelliJ as one of the other, IDE, ID, IDEA, sorry, um, is the is the tool that I use mostly now. And that's really great because it'll actually keep the Grails version that you're using local to it so that when you switch between projects, you're not having to do some command line Kung Fu to switch the Grails environment. So you can see I've got the stars indicate that these are the Grails versions that I have and the arrow shows which one I've got now. Um, this this will actually do it for Groovy as well. So it's just GVM install Grails and it'll do the latest if you want, or you can choose a version. Um, you can also do that with Groovy. And let's see if I have the latest Groovy. And I do, 2.1.1. And they're pretty quick about updating the tool with the latest uh, after it's released. Griffin's also on here. That's the desktop NVC framework, um, which was inspired by the Grails framework. So you can also, so you've got those three things. And it's even got Vertex which I'll touch on later, so you can. But my understanding at this point is that the Vertex is used for the internal tool for, G, for GVM, but um, it, it's available. So let me switch back here. Okay. Installing it, it's just using the curl command. And I can send these links in the slideshow um, afterwards and get people access to that. TextMate 2, um, I bought TextMate when version one, and so was, I stuck with it. And then when they released two as free open source, I just grabbed it rather than, I know the, what's the new one, Sublime, it's pretty, pretty, pretty nice, but I didn't want to pay for another IDE, so, or another text editor, I should say. But I was happy, this is the first and, the first and only IDE I've paid for this, at this point is the IntelliJ. Um, it's really, really nice. So I would recommend that tool. I'm not being paid to say that. I actually think this is a great tool. And I was exposed to it at work, and then I bought my private license here, personal license, when they had a sale at the end of, was it end of the world Mayan calendar celebration? Yeah, that's when I was able to pick up a personal copy. Okay, so first thing I'll go over is some groovy syntax. So the last talk we had with uh, concerning Lua, there were some questions about how there were some neat things that were happening in Lua, and um, I was surprised because a lot of the other languages like Ruby and Python had the same thing. So I thought I would cover the kind of some some things that that are common between the languages, just just to show um, contrast. I have links here for list examples, and we can we can look at what what's available to the list. Um, so you you can. This is defining a list. You know, you've got your size. You can get the class. 
it shows that it's an array list, it's a specific type. So you can do all the things that you're used to doing um, if you've done any Java programming. Um, and it looks pretty much similar to any of the other dynamic languages like JavaScript that you'd see with the way that you can index. Um, it's, it's zero indexed. It's not one indexed um, like, like Lua was. Uh, <clears throat> so there's just some cool things you can do. Push, pull, I mean push, pop, add. I think I'm a, I don't see pop, but I believe that's one of the actions. And iterators, and I'll show some more of this. Using each, you can iterate over the list. And this, this here, it, is given by default for this closure. Um, these curly braces here indicate that this is a closure. So you could actually write each with parentheses and then put this in the middle. I mean, yeah, put this in between the parentheses and it would work. But have, this is a little bit of syntactic sugar here so that you don't have to have parentheses around it. And you can do each with index and it gives you two, two variables. It gives you the actual item and then the index in the array. That's come in useful quite a few times from, for some of the stuff that I've done. Um, and then you've got functional type um, programming that you can use. So collect will take a list, and you see here it's multiplying by two. So collect essentially, if you've done any uh, functional programming, is like map. You're mapping this function, whatever, this is the function being passed, each element times two, and it's giving you the result set. And it's not mutating this original list here. So uh, it's pretty nice. This is another way of doing collect, it's star dot. And then this multiply is just a method on the list class. And you're multiplying by two. So it's equal to this on this right hand side is what they're showing you. And uh, this is just a shortcut, which is really nice if when you doing, especially in Grails, when you're, mess, when you're dealing with domain classes and you've got a list, let's say it's, um, you got an employee class and you've got a list of employees that you did find by employee that find by um, a criteria and you got a list of them. Well, you only, let's say you just need the first names. You can do star dot first name on the list and you've got the whole list of the names. So you don't have to, it's just a shortcut. It's kind of nice. You said that multiply is a method on the list. It's a, it's a method on the item in the list, right? Yes, I'm sorry, yes, yes, thank you. Right, because it's dereferencing the item in the list and then it's applying this. So it would be a method on number. Can you zoom in on this? Yep. Find all is just a filter. Again, that's what I, enclosure we would say filter. This one finds the first element and returns it. That matches the criteria. This one finds all elements. Um, and these are bullet conditions. Every, again, it, it kind of makes sense. It's real nice that it's very, very easy to grasp these, um, these closures, these methods. Some join, inject. Now inject's kind of a funny one because it doesn't, it's not one of the ones that doesn't speak exactly to what you would think. Uh, eject essentially is reduce. So here you see they're, they're injecting counting into this, this area here. They're taking a string and an item from the object that's coming in. And then they're concatenating the, the string and the item. So this is an accumulator here. And this is the item coming in. So they're taking that accumulator and then they're concatenating item to it. And as you can see, Counting gets thrown in first as the accumulator, and then it goes through and grabs the first element, which is one, and then it goes through and it concatenates again to get one, two, three. And this has always been kind of bothersome to me. So later I'll show that I've renamed through um, extension methods, I've created reduce, map, and filter, and it's essentially just using these same, these same names on the back end, but it's easier for, 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 my, for me to, to think about how I'm using those. Um, max, min, Let's see if we see anything in here that, there's just tons of, tons of, um, tons of things you can do with. Minus, this would, minus is more of some set, 
some set um, math. So I guess that's what you would say, set math. Yep. So you can see here that it's just removing all occurrences of B and C from the left hand side and you get this on the right hand side. So you're, is it called minus in set, in set theory? Difference? Yeah, difference, I guess. I can't recall the exact uh, effect verbiage, but it's set, no, it's, it's set math. Well, the only thing I was going to say is, you know, how you, you said that a lot of these ones return a new list. Yeah, there's a few that don't, though. Like, unique is, is a mutating one, which you have to be careful for. So, yeah, the, for, you know, I mean, since you guys are coming from a variety of languages, this is kind of where the ugliness of Groovy, you know, the interop is great, but some of the ugliness of, of job, I mean, works in. So remove does the same thing. Or you could do, there's a remove all. Okay. Um, which essentially does what minus does. Remove mutates the collection. Minus gives you back a new one. Okay. Um, so it's just, it's one of those, so for some of those set operators, and if you Google, there's some people that have put together like functional groovy lists where they'll show you, you know, which methods mutate and which ones return. Brand new collections, but yeah, that's the. I thought there was a there were they were working to resolve the unique because it's unexpected. You think that it's with all everything else, it's not consistent. But Jay, did you have a question? Uh, if you scroll back up, I was just trying to. Yeah, so the reason why they keep saying the list of no one is because it's returning a new list, so it's not new. Right. That's correct. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, clear. This is an append here. Is that what you were pointing at? Oh, pop. Oh, pop, yeah. So this has been overwritten to, to append, and this works for strings as well. I believe it turns it into a string buffer, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Useful operators and methods in uh, contains contains all is empty. There we go. Intersect. These are more the set set methods. Disjoint. Sort. Now this will take a um, and I'll show I'll show later. This will take a closure and you can define your own sort on the fly. So if you needed to reverse this, I'll show an example where it takes a closure and it actually will reverse the list for you using what's called the spaceship operator, which is a comparator. One, is this, I wonder if this uh, increase in the Python cones thing, which is a, basically a test driven development way of learning. Yeah. This looks, at, the first thing you do is a whole bunch of asserts. <coughs> mm-hmm. You know, have asserts in the route. Yeah. But it's also dependent upon what version of Python you're running. Yeah. So do you happen to know, is this is this code here, is that very dependent on what version of Groovy you're running? Or no, there's, a few, there's only a few things I would think that have changed at this level um, over the years with the Groovy code. And I don't believe that this w anything that you grab today would be affected by, by versioning for, the, for running these no, I agree. I think, I mean, all this stuff's been there for a long time, and mm -hmm. for the most part, the three people have been pretty good at adding functionality, but I'm not sure any of the behaviors change. So if you see an example, it's, it's probably going to work. If it worked in a previous version, it's still there. Okay. And uh, on that list of versions you had, like if you started, I think, at 1.5? Yeah. There's probably at least 20 or 30 of them there. Over yeah. how long is that? I mean, is that Ooh. a few years? Uh, it's It's... Probably the lifetime of the project. They put all the versions in there, so you're seeing you're seeing yeah. very early. Well, one o, we used one o, uh, eight years ago, maybe something like that. So yeah. it's pretty mature. Yeah, and recently the two o was crossed here, um, within the last year. They usually publish about one version a quarter, I think, roughly, something like that. Unless there's a serious patch That's that needs to be. Then they'll put it out right away. Yeah. But I haven't seen too many serious patches needing to come through in recently. 
It's, it's pretty stable. It's really nice, actually, uh, how stable it is to the languages at this point. So there's just some more iterating. And what's really nice about this is most of these things will apply with the exception of the index stuff, will apply to the maps, hash maps, or dictionaries, if you're familiar with, I'm not sure what terminology, the languages that you use, um, use, but ranges. So this will give you a range of values, and you can see here five, six, seven, and eight. You don't want to include eight, you use this symbol here, but the dot dot between the two numbers gives you a range of values. So you can iterate over them, so if you had, if you, and I've done this before where I needed to create, in Grails I do this a lot, if I need to create some um, test data and it requires some numeric values, I'll do a range and then use that as part of the values and it'll say, you know, 5.8 dot dot each. And then I'll go through and it'll, the each will give you an iterator, IT, or you can define your, what you want to call it. And you can just create new domain class, or instances and, and with, with those values. And again, I'll show, I'll show some examples of that uh, later. Now this, I, I wasn't aware of this, but being able to do characters, that's really nice. See, and here, here's an example, one through 10, 55, because it, they've defined n is zero, so they're taking the, the default iterator um, with it, which would be each individual item gets passed in and it's accumulating, so then you can see that this is 55. So the first time it comes in, it is one, the second time it's two, and so we're just accumulating here. Real nice, real short. Uh, okay. Some defaults, reverse. Um, Collect, using the collections and then the, its built-ins. Okay. I'll kind of zoom through this so we don't consume the whole time. Do you want me to stop anywhere? Let me know. I'll just kind of go through and give it. There's the unique. I'm not seeing this, this unique MC. Is collections and groovy by default? I'm sorry, is collections what? Is collections and groovy by default or is that something you include? Or? Yeah, it's just there. Okay. It's not for the, that's not the you don't, collection. You don't have to, no, it's, no. It's a separate one. It's, well. Well, let's see. That's your topic, right? Yeah, well, uh, so you, we'll see, we'll try it out. I'm not used to this. I mean, the, the collections are meta classes, really. Yeah. Are they? I mean, all this stuff is enhancements. It's not part yeah. of. Right, so you wouldn't have to do an import. So we'll go ahead and. So Groovy, when you download Groovy and got it running, it gives you a swing app, the Groovy console, or you can use Groovy SH, Groovy Shell, and go in interactive mode. I tend to go with the console because. There's some more power in the console. If you wanted to get into some AST transformations or see what the code's doing, you can do that. But So we'll go ahead and throw this in here and see what happens. Oh, this doesn't have anything. Yeah, I'll, I'll bump this up here in a minute. Is that, 
Let's look at that example real quick. Because I didn't see what list was. Let's do this. Control. The Apple Plus. There. Let's just do this. So there's no there's no error. So this is all part of Groovy. print out the list. Parentheses are mostly optional, unless you get a little bit more complicated than you would wrap this in parentheses, but this is valid Groovy to do print line. And you can see that the third has been rotated there. So the, the, in Java, it would be system.out.println. Um, Groovy's just cut it down. We'll leave this open so that we can come back if we have any more questions. Um, so this this is really nice to be able to take a list and then make it a set you use as. And this this will work not in many instances. Uh, you know, if you need something to be as an integer as long, um, I'll do this occasionally. Oh, I used to until in the controllers and grails where you, before you could define the types um, that were coming in. When you'd get params and you'd have to dereference params, and I would take a, an ID that would need to be long, but it comes in as a string, and I could just say as long. So this is doing a conversion here, turning this into a set. Lots of set stuff. Tree set's really nice. I use this for one of the um, Euler, I believe that's what it's, how it's pronounced, the Euler uh, problems. Pretty, pretty quick. The mutable stuff. Um, pretty nice little write up on how, how to get some things done with lists. My, okay, I did. Okay, um, we'll spend a little less time on how maps work, but maps are essentially your, like I said, dictionaries. I believe it's what they're called in Perl. Is that right? Hash. Hash. Okay, similar concept. Now these are these are marked with um, strings, but you could leave the strings off and it would still be an identifier. As long as it's not a keyword, it should be fine. I'm sorry? Pretty close. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, so some of the, what you'd be used to, do you reference the position? I'm sorry, you're assigning here these values. These are all the different things you can put in there. So similar to JavaScript, when you dereference them, you can use the brackets to, to for a map. You can give the um, the key, or you can say dot key name, and it'll it'll pull the value out. So, uh, let's see if they have an instance here. So you print line map, and it gives you foo and bar. But if you did print line map dot foo, it would give you bar. Is empty, contains key. Um, key set will give you all the keys. Um, collection views of map. Just showing what you can get the key and the value. Or hopefully they'll show an example here. Okay. Similar, you can see find all. This is all stuff that you already saw in the list, so I'm not gonna, I'm gonna just kind of scroll through real quick. Spread operator, that's what we were discussing earlier with the star dot. These each have an A, so you can see that it grabbed the list and it grabbed the, the A property from that. 
grouping, some internal stuff. And let's see if there's anything else in here. Sorted, mutable maps. Okay, we'll go ahead and jump to another topic. So we can iterate maps and list using each. Collect, inject, find all, sort using the spaceship operator. So we'll, I'll click on that. So this is defining a new sort right here. And it's just reversing the set. So it takes B value, since this is a key, key value, and then it's putting it, it's just reversing the order. Pretty easy to do. And if you, it's real, it's real nice if you have a quick thing that you need to reverse, or however you need to sort it, if you've got a, a list of classes that have a property you want to sort on. So we talked about this operator uh, we've got the Elvis operator, and it's named because it looks like Elvis, right? See the curly hair and the eyes? And I'm going to pull up the syntax here. Let me, is that big enough? Okay. Okay, so return, return statement's optional. Yeah, I'm going to actually... Pull it back over here. Okay, so this will print world. There's no return statement here. So the last the last thing that's executed is what gets returned. These are closures, similar to lambdas in Python. And blocks in Ruby, is that right? Ruby programmers, blocks. Okay, so I define it here. Well, let's just bring this over because this will make more sense if I ran the code. So I'm going to define this closure called close, and if I wanted to type, give it a type, I could. It would be clo closure. And it's going to print hello plus whatever's been passed to it. It, again, is given for you at, if you've not defined it, and I'll show you what I mean. Right here is I'm defining two variables. This, this indicates that I've defined something, so it will not be given to me by default. So, got the closure, does this, and then I can call it, invoke it by adding the parentheses. Or I can call it. So we'll go ahead and run it. Oops. Let's do this. Okay. Okay. So you can see hello and null came out because I was appending it, which I didn't pass anything, so it's null. Now the second one takes an takes an item and it just prints up what's been passed, and so high has been passed. And you can see high is right there. And then this third one's taking parameters, which I've defined as one and two. Again, I could put the types in there if I wanted to put string or integer. And then I'm using the G string here, which will allow me to pass in values using dollar sign. And there's two ways you can you can put you can just do the dollar sign and then the variable name, or if you've got a little bit more complexity to what you want to to evaluate, you can put the brackets around it and add more. So, okay, you can see that I gave one and two. Now, the cool one of the cool things is that you can curry. You can curry one of those values, and so here I take this closure with parameters and define a new variable to to take the curried, the curried version of it. So I'm passing in as this one here is I am curried. And then I pass in a one, and I pass in the, this text second parameter and still have it going. And you, you can see I've only passed in one parameter rather than these two here that you saw. And you can see that it shows up each time I invoke it. I don't have to pass it in again. Any questions so far? 
So closures also have the ability to be memoized, and it's just adding this to the end of it, and this is the example Fibonacci that's memoized. Yes. Um, okay. Some further topics that I won't cover today with closures is that you can, it's got this owner and delegate in it. That's a, for more dynamic things that you want to happen with that code. I've seen the delegate, the delegate, I've seen that used for um, passing searches. I th one of the projects that I inherited had delegate overwritten so that it could do dynamic searching based on a certain criteria. So the same closure can be used multiple ways. It's just a way to do code reuse if you, if you do this correctly. Builders will, and I'll show a builder later, one of the things they do is take advantage of, of um, delegate, I believe, to, to, get, to get the code structures that you want. And I'll show an example of that. Uh, yep, so. Here's a list, you can get the class and that's built in. You can get the class of anything. If you run into issues with this, the other way to do it is do class name. Um, I've only run into a few issues and I can't recall why this may not work on certain, certain items. I'd have to look that up. So if we did here, you can see that this, these two are different because I've used the as. I've got an array list and a linked hash set, and that was because I asked for it here. <coughs> Some cool things that have been more recent are transforms. So we've got, we're gonna go ahead and pull down to this level here. These are, these are AST transformations that help reduce boilerplate code. So I created this person class, you know, takes these values, and then I, I'm doing multiple assignment here. These three things will get stuffed in to these three things. And then I'm printing out the details. Now, I didn't define a two string, but I've added this to the class. So it'll give me one, and it looks like that. So if you've got something quick that you don't really need to override the string with anything special, you can certainly use this. There's other transforms on there. So this gives me all three values. I didn't give, I didn't give a um, full name, so that came back as a null for, for a specific reason, and I'll show that in a second here. So I've got the list of people I want. This is what I was speaking to earlier, is I just want all the last names. And you can see that we've got the last names. Um, or I can use collect and get the first names. Oops. And you can see we get our first names. And inject. And I renamed it to accumulator and value, because to me that makes more mo most sense. And you can see I'm taking the value in and uppercasing it and then appending it to the double pipe just to show some separation. And then there we are. And then this last one is a filter. Find all with A in it. Oops. So only two of us were found. Um, this, this is interesting because if you add a third, third one here, um, it, I believe it's expecting a pattern on the right-hand side, whereas this will convert it into a pattern and do the matching. So in Java, it's kind of a few steps. You'd have to create a pattern and then the matcher, and then you would, then you would do the, the regexing. So this is using regex here. So that brings another point here. Now you see that. Uh, actually, I think I have an example here. Okay, so here's all the string examples. There's a few ways that you can define strings in Groovy. You, the single quote, regular string, you can use the slash here. And this makes a lot of sense if you're mostly when you're doing regex, because it, it just reads what I'm used to when I was doing Perl. It just re reads real nice. Um, and this is the G string. 
that takes dollar bills. Or not dollar bills, just dollars, I guess. That's a groovy joke. <laughs> so this, this allows for these values to be interpreted and evaluated in the string. And this is also, there's lazy. So that you can use this to do some lazy, lazy tricks. Um, I don't have any examples, but I just wanted to make a note because I had found that out the other day. I didn't realize that these were lazy. You can run into problems um, some, with, I, know, I believe I ran into issues with Groovy SQL in that it expects a string and it doesn't always convert this to a string. So I have to actually do the dot to string to get it to, to work. So just as a note, um, they're not all equal as far as types go. And so if we run this, you can see that uh, one, okay, I must, uh, oh, this guy here. Uh, just throw something in there. Okay. Do I have F name in here? Oh, yeah. Let's just do this. I had the other example in here and when I tested this, so we'll just do this. And add a, okay. All right. See that that was a G string implementation when I printed out the class here. <coughs> this here, because I use the double quotes, it's it's using the G string implementation. G string will allow you to evaluate variables within it. So I can't see right here this one, this word one, is actually a variable that I defined up here. Right. It's, you can't do that with a normal string. No, you can't. Yeah, you'd have to do the plus and then concatenate it. Well, I'm sorry, what's the question? Way down at the bottom. Oh, this here, yeah. Or, or, sorry, You're asking about this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that would be that would be idiomatic. And now that's universally mined by the and I can collect residuals. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing that's cool about strings is there's a if you guys have to do a lot of XML stuff, there's a triple quoted string. Yeah, this is one I was going to show oh. here. No, go ahead. You can. I was going to say it it's preserves the character terms. So. Um, a lot of people will do unit testing with blocks of XML. And so I'm a multi-line string. And b it, the triple coded string will actually still interpret variables as well. So, so you can see that I am, and it shows the variable there that I defined. The question was classic. So codes.org is the official group. This isn't going out to domain. This is using jars and yeah. um, the class. Yeah. So that's a package name. Oh, Maven. Maven's a big repository. Um, Ivy is that? Ivy uses yeah. Maven though, right? Yeah, I'm just trying to understand how namespaces. Namespaces is usually the domain, reverse domain. But there's no, but there's no, but there's no yeah. like governing body that you just yeah you just get trouble when you try to load the VM. You know, which one do you use? But I mean, yeah. so so in, so in theory, you know, we could create our own library and throw org.codehouse.groovy and. You know. Yeah, it's all class there's, path there's resolution. That would prevent that from. Yeah. Is there a CPAN equivalent? Um, you know, comprehensive Pro Archive Network. 
We're at the command line, you know, you can put in what you're searching for, and it'll go out to the software repository, give you some search results, and then do another command, and then start. No, no. Maven's kind of what yeah, you use. Yeah, like sign type and stuff in front of Maven, trying to get that, but not really figuring out that. No, you kind of have to know what you want before it'll pull it into the project. There's not a discovery tool at this point. That doesn't mean that someone's not working on it. I can see Groovy being a real good choice for developing it. Now there's a there's an annotation called grab which <coughs> will pull it into a file if you're if you're let's say you have a dependency and you, you need to get an HTTP lib library uh -huh. and you know it and you just want to write a script that does it. Well you can annotate it with grab and give it the the parameters that'll go out and grab it and put it into the project. Um, but there's no search like I need a widget. There's no real search to do that other than what well, I use Google. It's kind of yeah. yeah. I'd have to leave the command line. Yeah. Well, no, you can yeah. Google it from the command line. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some there's some real nice things built into the classes. Um, kind of a contrived example is let's see, string. So in Perl, if you wanted to do, well, I won't show that one. Let's just do this. That's, I think that's right. Let's see if this works. Is it case sensitive? Yes. Oops, let's do this. Okay, clear that out and we'll go down. So this is a quick way to pull down information in one line from the web page. So the string's been over, the string has had these added to it, the two URL, and then you can do the text and pull it all out. Um, Occasionally, this comes in handy. I've got a, a way that I've got an example somewhere that shows how to do post. Um, one of the first projects I did when I was learning Java was trying to do a Flickr uploader downloader program, and um, I remember working through the Java code that was out. And once I found this 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 nicety, this was really 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 slick for what I needed it to do. So, so which method is actually doing the fetching? Is it the URL or the, the text? The text. This creates a URL connection, and then they, they added the text to actually do the consumption. Um, and text is really, really crazy because you can, so the, this convention of text is also for files. So if you open a new file, um, let's say I had a file that I wanted to look at. Uh, I think new, whoops. And I'm just going to, sorry, my file. I'm not actually going to open it, but I'm just going to show the syntax. I can get the text this way, you know, and have it go to a string. Or, and I just learned this uh, a couple weeks ago, I can actually rewrite the whole file with text to the right. So it's it's kind of interesting what you can do with, I didn't know this This was one of the methods. And there's an each line on method too, so if you yeah. over it, there's... Right, so, so he would, this would be the other way to go through, right? Oh, sorry, line. My fingers, okay. Most of the time I will define line because it's easier for me to read. So that, you know, if you wanted to print out the line to the screen you could or augment it however you, however you felt the need to. We'll move on. Oh, okay. Terminator. Terminary. Terminator. So I'll clear the screen and just show some examples of the operators. So this is the condition here. Depending on how complex it is, I'll either, sometimes I'll put it in parentheses to, as kind of catching my eyes. Oh, that's the condition. So this is the true. If this condition is true, then it'll execute this one, otherwise it'll do the turn, the else part. So this is, if, if true, do this, else do this. And it's, a, you know, it's a, you can just do assignment with that. I use this pretty frequently, uh, more so than the, the, than the next one, which is the Elvis operator. Um, so display name is going to equal, if one, this is also really cool. This is a null check. So if there, if this is a null value, it won't, 
explode with a null pointer exception. It'll just not execute it, and it'll go over to and evaluate the Elvis will actually be assigned to display name. So we can see here, strike trace. Oh, again, I'm using one over and over again. Let's put one back in so that these will work. OK. There we go. Ternary and then Elvis was, since this didn't have a full name, because I didn't define it earlier, then it went, Elvis was given it, so. OK. Let's see. OK, we did the string and then ranges. This was just what we saw earlier. I'll just re-post it. You can see that 0 through 8 was given. It, this is a pretty simple uh, closure here, so I didn't define it. Depending on how complex or what I'm expecting to come through, um, sometimes I will make it more readable for, the, for when I come back or the next person. Most of the times I actually do put in the, uh, the, a name. This isn't a type. I could put in a type if I wanted it to be number. Then it would accept all variants of number subclasses in long. And any subclass of number? Yeah, so, so numbers can be long. Um, numbers this is kind of the parent class, and then you've got the subset from there, yeah. So it, 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 I could, you could liken it to if you've got an animal, and then you've got your subclasses of types of animals. Well, this number is kind of like that hierarchy of sits up here, so it can actually understand what, what's going on. Object oriented. Yeah, ob object oriented type hierarchies. Well, is that you've got, I mean. Yeah, but uh, you would think. But there's lots of things that surprise me about that they invent all kinds of things. Like they don't like SQL, so they invented this thing called SOQL, which is all very interesting object based structured object query language, et cetera. So, it, you know, it's very, hey, we're, you know, smoking something tonight and we invented this thing, <laughs> and here's the syntax of this thing. So, yeah, I, I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying I think I hit that yes, or yep, yeah, yesterday. Where I was like, hey, this is a base class. And it goes, oh, no, it ain't. It's this very specific subclass. And I'm like, well, yes, it is, but that wasn't the point. I was supposed to, I was trying to tell you this is a base class. But, you know, as my, when I was defining the area, and it was mad at me, I think. But again, that's Apex. That's crazy. So I was to or I was doing wrong. Okay. Well, we're on numbers. Is there a, a max in? Yes. In a, yes. In type? Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the things we can do is, uh, well, you know, I could look it up. A lot of times I'll just go to Java and look up, uh, well, you said int, so we can look at integer. There we go. Sorry, I'm going to get small here so I can. So it's a static here, and I'll blow it up for you to see here. So you could say integer dot max value, and you would get the maximum value that it can have. So what if you do, uh, you try to print a negative of min value for blow up? Let's find out. Would that be positive, one more than what the max is? What was the actual, was it just min value? Uh, 
Oh, did I misspell that? Yeah. So it's throwing off because I didn't. Here, let's try this. Well, yeah, because it's throwing. Yeah. There you go. So, but do now. Um, you want me to print the actual but, value? I mean, that, see, that's a negative number. Wasn't that what you said? The negative of. Right. But it prints out as a negative number, so I'm not I wonder if it was actually converted to negative. So wouldn't it already be negative? Yeah, yeah, it's already it's negative. negative. So you take a negative or a negative and it should be true. Probably in parents again. Oh, I see. You want to do this? Yeah. Okay. We'll comment this one out and run it. Okay, so that's what it's saying here. So let's do both. Let's see what it was before. Yeah. Just ignored it. So, um... Zero minus. You can multiply by negative one. Yeah. Let's try this. Yeah, I like those question marks. It's null. Oh right, the null check. I don't know. We'll come back to this. It's a good question though. Let me sidebar this. Put it in my notes here. <laughs> so we were over here. Yeah. So numeric, but numeric literals by default are integer or big int. I can't remember. You know. By default. Yeah. Like just numbers, I think they're big. They're like big decimal places. Well, no, I don't think I, I don't think I, so. Yeah, so I was trying to remember because right? I get confused. Like closure used to be. Big it's kind of annoying. Big it's integer. It's integer, but then yeah. So decimals though, so that's a little bit different. Decimals are all big decimal, which is great, I think. Um, big decimal. Because then you get real math. And it, or shouldn't that one be lowered or something? No, that's what's nice about, about I <coughs> think it's nice about Groovy, is by default any number with a decimal point is a big decimal <coughs> instead of a float or a double. So for business apps where you're, oh, you know, you get 1 plus, you know, 1.1 .1 plus 0 0.1, you get 1.2 instead of 1.1999. And yeah, yeah, that makes me crazy. Uh, for, I mean, it depends on how you, so is, is Java a business language or is it an assembly language? You know, kind of, or, you know, I mean, but for, I mean, because a lot of people use it for business apps. So it's like, well, for business apps, I've never, I haven't written a business app yet in Java oh, where a value that has a decimal point in it should be a float. Right. I mean, I, I probably will someday, but not. I mean, there's. I, I, I've been on the look out for it too. <laughs> there's, there's nothing. There's nothing I've ever used where that decimal point didn't matter. That somewhere it fed back into something that. Yeah. You know, it, it needed to tie back. So I really like Ruby for that reason in business apps. So there was a a project or initiative called Project Coin, which um, brought up some, some new syntax, uh, among other things. But one of the things you can do here is put underscores in to de denote a value so it's easier to read. So this is valid. You can see here that it actually goes ahead and does the addition here with the, the values. Real helpful. Is that work for just integers, or does that work for um Numbers that have decimal points as well. What if you want to print that out with common? You do a format. Uh, so you're saying let's try this. Wait. Oh, nice. There's some more syntax that has been added around numbers and that sort of thing. Um, just wanted to point out something that 
I thought was pretty helpful in some, most of the apps, when we work with large numbers, it's really, really nice to, to be able to eyeball that. And you usually didn't do a bunch of float in your actuarial equations and stuff? Oh, float? Yeah. No, they would kill us for that. Really? Well, because, well, oh, because, because. Well, why do they do the logarithmic mean? Because, because they have to, no, they need real numbers. They need, they need, they need rationals, not floats. They, I mean, the decimal points really matter. And they matter in a big way. I mean, it, I had a, um, actuary throw together um, an example of where you, you could be off on, um, and these aren't big numbers. I mean, they don't have to be big numbers to get this effect. If you have a, a rating factor, so let me back up. So in, insurance, basically, kind of everybody, they, they have this base rate, and then they just start multiplying it by numbers around the number one. You know, I'm, I'm this age, so they're going <coughs> to multiply that rate by 1.1 or by 0.9. So there's a whole bunch of numbers right around the number one that are all these multipliers. Well, if, you're, <clears throat> if you mean 0 0.1, you don't mean 0 0.1999 or whatever it is. I mean 1.0.2. Mm -hmm. And if you multiply those over and over again, it translates into hundreds of thousands of dollars if you have a really big group and you don't have numerical accuracy. Yeah. I mean, it's, it was pretty interesting. He, he showed me on an annual premium once. He goes, yeah, I'd be, I'd be off by thousands of dollars if... If you guys um, used there, <coughs> there are certain apps floating the point numbers yeah. instead of a, a big decimal, a true rational number. There are certain apps that we we've had that have that same issue, where we've let the database handle it. So with triggers and that sort of thing, um, that way it stayed consistent for the yeah, client. Yeah, most databases get um, decimal number accuracy. Right. I mean, what we learned in math class and what they store is the same thing. You don't run into this. There's this problem of there's not a binary representation of that decimal number. So, yeah, yeah, floats and doubles are, like I said, there's no business app I've ever done where using a double is okay. You know, I mean, it's, you always run that risk of, of being off by something. Yeah, I wonder if that happens in engineering, maybe. I well, I think I think with scientific calculations it's different, yeah. but but when you're when you're tying back to money, you know, of, of any kind for sure, or inventory quantities, you know, I mean, you know, those 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 things need to sum back up. The parts need to sum back up to whatever the whole was, and if you start using quotes or doubles, it, you, and especially if you multiply those things by other factors, then yeah. So we'll move on. We've, kind of, we've covered the syntax. These are the topics that we'll kind of go through that I've got here. I've talked about GVM already. Um, I'll talk a little bit about invoke dynamic and what that means. And meta object programming. That was one of the topics that so, someone had said they were really interested in doing or hearing tonight. And are you going to cover extensions too? Yep. So, we will go, we'll start with category. And I've got the, <coughs> excuse me, before I go into the, the details of how I've tested this, Gradle is a build tool that I highly recommend if you can use it um, for building your projects around the, actually, the Grails now uses Gradle as its build tool. It's real powerful. It uses it uses Groovy as its as its language to create the tasks and do that sort of, and do those sorts of things. And I'll show you the build file for this particular um, instance here. Like, oh, I've got too many things open. There we go. Build Gradle. So I'm applying the Groovy plugin, so it pulls the tasks and stuff that are specific to Groovy. Here we go. Sorry. And then these, this, this is the, the Maven type um, dependencies. And it goes and grabs this. I tell it what, you know, what, what to grab and which version. 
And Spock is an awesome, awesome test framework. So you can use this for your Java projects or, or Groovy. Um, there's some write-ups on how to do it with, with, uh, with Java. I'll show the, the Groovy specs. Everything's a spec, specification. And in Grails, you, you, you have different specifications. You have your integration specification. You've got um, unit and unit. So. so I create the specification for the category, and I'll go back and show what category is here. I created this ninja utility, and it can throw ninja stars. And whatever calls it, it will add this to that. And it just says, takes that object, turn, puts it into a string, and returns back, can now throw stars. So we'll go back. We'll do a setup, create a person. Um, we'll test categories. So the methods are strings for the test suite. It expects one of the keywords. Um, so it only has to be one line. It expects whatever your assertions or whatever your conditions are. I expect this person to be able to talk. Um, is, is this code by context at this point? No. no. And then I'm going to test exception here. Person throws ninja stars. It isn't going to work because I, it's not actually a part of the person class. And the person class, oh, it's, it's down at the bottom here. So here's the person class. You can talk. This person can talk. It has a name. The person has a name and then it has a two-string name. So that's where talk, we expect it to say hello. We're expecting an exception. When, I do, when I, this person tries to throw ninja stars, it doesn't have that defined on the person class. I'm expecting it to throw a missing method exception. In Groovy, there's a bunch of what think I won't get into the details because it's it's pretty it's pretty uh, it's a pretty big concept to to go over all at once. But it goes through propagation and looks for different ways to resolve methods. And I can talk or show give you resources if you're interested afterwards on where you could find how it does the propagation and figuring those things out. So this will be the working version. Uh, in order to use a category, you must have a use statement to use the behavior to add the use, add the behavior. Ruby has something similar called refinements that I, I believe it has just was announced recently and how that works. Um, this has been a lot. This has been around in Groovy for quite some time. Uh, so you use the keyword use. And this is all on one line, but if I wanted to use in one closure, I could do multiple things. And you can use multiple utilities if you wanted to add functionality. You have a ninja star or ninja util, maybe you have a superhero util, and you could use them all at the same time, but you just you would just put them in this use clause. So I'll put this back so it's more readable. Okay, so because I've used this statement here. This dynamic method that's been added is only allowed within this clause. So it's not global. It's fixed to a certain area if you needed to use it. So Larry can now throw stars. The number one can now throw stars. Dogs can now throw stars. It's madness, I tell you. And in order to run, run the... Um, so I'll kill the console here. So it'll run through all my specs. And when it's all done, it'll look similar to this, the test page is all my tests passed. And it just nice, neat. You can dive in if you want. Any questions on the use and categories? <coughs> You know, one of the things that I, uh, when I first started using Groovy, a lot of the Ruby people, so one of the big things you can do in Rails, right, is it adds all these dynamic methods to objects, but it's, but it's global. So mm -hmm. if somebody overrides 
you know, the equivalent of a two-string method on a number class. You know, it affects all the numbers in your whole application. And if you pull in a library that does that, you know, it affects, again, your whole app, which means, and, and you know, a lot, one of the, it's really powerful, it's nice to be able to do that, but one of the problems is if you're pulling in a whole bunch of different libraries and people add dynamic methods on the same class, you know, which one wins, there's, there's, no, there's no control over that. And I know a lot of people complained at first about uh, the use or the category mm -hmm. being scoped, but for me, I thought that that was really powerful because um, some of the things that you'll see people do is they'll use a date category or a, um, like a units of measure category, so you could go one dot pounds or one dot ounces, but it's good because it's only scoped mm -hmm. uh, for that block. So you're not stepping on the behavior of the integer class for the whole rest of the application, um, just for the area that you care about, which I, personally I, th I thought was safer. It made, I think yep. There's a lot of places where I prefer to use a category versus the global transform. We'll, go, we'll do command chaining last. We'll go to kind of what you're talking about. Um, Hulk, I call this the Hulk interceptor. This is adding dynamic um, stuff at runtime. So we'll go ahead, have a class Hulk. Uh, he likes to smash and he smashes whatever you give him. Uh, we'll run it, we'll kind of see what, what happens here when he, so Hulk smash car, you see all these things here and we'll walk through. So um, here you can see I, got a, I have a brand new Hulk Hulk maniac. He smashed his car. You can see he smashed the car. Now, what we're doing here is we're going to intercept all methods that get called on the Hulk class. So we override the invoke or we define invoke method. It's going to take a string name and the arguments. Uh, let me tidy this up here so you can see. Why can't I get this thing to? This is of methods, right. Definitions of That's correct. Okay. Ooh. Thank God. <laughs> if we were intercepting definitions of methods. No, no. That'd be confusing. <laughs> well, so, you, go ahead. You could, right? Don't look at this two transform. Uh, you yes, you could. I believe you could. Like but compile time. Like compile time. You yes. Jump up and say ah. Yeah, and I'll talk a little bit about how that would work. Yeah. So, invoke. So the first time we go through this, there's, there's nothing being, it's not catching anything because I haven't defined it yet. So it smashes and then we got this. So now every time a method is used, we're gonna inter intercept it and I'm gonna just throw this in there. So this is AOP kind of thing, aspect-oriented programming. You can kind of do a before or after, however you want to, to write your code. You can essentially do that here. So anything that gets called after that it will say he thinks he wants to. And then it, it looks for a valid method. So it's, it's, it's essentially grabbing the method name from the meta class. So if you wanted to see something, all of the properties on the, that a class has to offer, you could, you could query the meta class and see what's available. If it's not null, if it's actually been found, it skips this, but if it is null, Hulk doesn't understand that. It doesn't, it's not in his available methods. So it's gonna punt or throw missing a method exception. Method, this does not get called as invoke method takes precedence. So we need to manually call it. So here I'm actually manually calling the invoke method, method mess, messing, missing method, wow passing in the delegate, which is the, the closure here, name and arguments. So back to here, you can see that he thinks he wants to smash this puny robot. So he does, because he found it. And the next thing I say is he wants to read a book. He doesn't know how to read a book. So that's where this comes in. He does not understand how to read a book. And you can see that the missing method exception was called because I'm printing that out. Then the next thing is the super amped up Hulk, thoughtful Hulk, I call him. 
So he, he'll smash this robot. This is what we saw earlier. The ex caught that exception. So now he, he's able to learn how to do it. Because I, I add it to the class. Whatever, whatever's, being, whatever's being asked of the Hulk can now be added straight to that class. And then it, it can be cached for later so that you don't go through the whole setup of adding a dynamic class at runtime. You just can add it straight to the class. Um, so the missing method here says he's going to learn. And after much reflection, he's now able to do the thing that you want. So now he's able to read a book. This is what Grails uses for the dynamic finders in the domain class. So those things like find all persons with name, like, those are all generated at runtime. And they use this same methodology of, of doing that. Questions? Yep, right here. So I caught it. I don't, I'm not actually writing any code that does anything spectacular. He's not creating, and you're not creating a new method yet. No. I mean, he has, there's, there's not code there to do that, but you could. Yeah. At that point, you could say, you could define a new method with the name that was passed in and, and assign behavior to it. Oh, so right. So there where it says, I'm now able to, it's a line because it didn't actually define that. Right. So he's a lying Hulk. Okay, gotcha. But I could put I could put the code in here to do that. There we go. So okay, so that's that's intercepting. Did you write all that? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, that's great. I like the Hulk example. Oh, I've got I've got quite a few Hulk Hulk <laughs> examples around. Yeah, it's, it's, Hulk's one of the, he's one of the faves. Um, this does not exist. I think this is the same thing. Let's see what happens here. This is just an intercepting stuff here. And again, it's, it's not actually pushing it onto the deal, so we'll move on. I showed memoirs earlier. So mix-ins. We can import the mixing class. So we've got this spaceship starting takeoff. I believe I, I got this example off the web, and I should have put the URL in here to attribute who had this up. So I apologize for that. Submarine can dive. So we've got this tree that grows leaves. We create a new tree. We have two instances of them. And we're going to mix in submarine and spaceship to the tree. So now the tree can take off, dive, and grow leaves. But the second instance, we didn't put the mixin in, so it will actually have an, an error. So you can see starting rockets. This tree starts the rockets, begins descent, grows leaves, and then I catch the error because two doesn't have the mixin. What is this evil pumping window? This is just the, the output. I'm running it, and this is just showing me the output, and it's just themed with a Halloween theme. Is that part of yeah, I I think I downloaded it. I don't know that it was it wasn't part of the original deal, but it's a TextMate window. Uh, so, all right, and we'll jump to the family tree builder. So builders. You have XML builders, you have swing builders. It's just an easy way if you have a structure that you, that you want to abstract to make it easier. Um, I'll show what it, the end looks like and briefly talk about how that works. So I'm going to create a Greek family tree. Kronos is the dad and has many kids, Zeus, right? So we, these characters from mythology. It's going to build a tree and then I print out the, the tree. So similar to XML, this could be XML, and I've, I've used the XML builder, but this is defining your own builder. So it's just the way you have to incorporate creating nodes and how those relate to each other. Um, parent, child, builder support. So you're extending the builder support and then creating your, your tree in code. 
Again, the XML builder is really nice if you have to build XML using Groovy, and it looks exactly like this. You know, your tag name would be here, attributes would be in, in the center here, uh, and then this would be nested. This is essentially nested. In XML, if you had an XML, then you know you have your whatever. If it's person, person, and then you have name, and then you have the attribute. You can put attributes in there. HTML builders. That's also um, a d defined. Do you know? I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I don't. I don't know. Okay. They're really lightweight to build, though. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, JSON. JSON builder. Yeah. 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 So there, Groovy comes with a JSON um, class okay. that will do the conversion of most types. It's pretty good. I haven't had any issues with it. So if you've got a map or a list, it'll you just say as JSON. Okay, so I'll use that in Grails a lot, actually. I'll grab my domain classes and if I, or whatever it is, domain classes or, or I create some maps and then I can render it as JSON. It takes it, converts it, and makes it valid. Um, really nice. It's all built, that, that's a part of Groovy. Um, <laughs> quick example on name parameters. So we've got this wizard class. He has clothes, powers, and a beard. So right here, when I, I create a new wizard and then set up, this is a method right here, setup wizard. And I use this, Grails uses this quite a bit, where you can put the parameter names in. It's, it's, I don't know, I like it, it's nice. Rather than doing positional, you can just put in the, the values you want. So you, it makes it easier to read, you understand what you're doing. So this test class, has two properties in it, one and two. Th this is cool. I found found this out a couple weeks ago that you can convert this to a test class. It has two two values in it, and since test class has two properties, this is valid, or this is valid. Uh, let's see. Constructors are a little different. You have to define the map constructor yourself. But it works essentially, after you've got that defined, it works the same. You can say property and property as you create a new instance of it. Okay. Uh, well, I'm confused right Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you're looking at this one yeah, right here. Yeah, like ha what, having to explicitly define a map constructor. Yeah. So you can get name property stored. That's correct. Um, I don't think so. I mean, I, I use that syntax all the time. And I don't define custom constructors. Because if it doesn't, if the map, uh, if it doesn't exist, it calls the zero argument constructor and then starts calling sets on all of those map properties. It calls the setters one at a time. Uh, okay. I, mean, I, I, I use that everywhere. I mean, that's the nice thing about it is you don't have to define any constructors in your class. So you you're, s you're, you're saying if I don't define the const let's take this example here. Yeah. If you have a simple class with first name and last name, you can go, well, I thought you already did that. You, you did that with your person class. Right, but if you, have, if you have a constructor defined already. Oh, you're saying if you've already have. Yeah. See right here, I've got, okay. I've got okay, one. I, I missed that part, okay. I've got one here that's already defined. Fine, so then you have to create it yourself. Because otherwise it's not going to know which one to call. Right. Well, I didn't. I didn't explain it either. So, well, this is the last of the. Oh, there's one more. It's real quick here. Yes. Yeah. So this is another. So you can do type checking in, in Groovy now with this transform. Um, so we'll go ahead and run this once real quick. Okay, works fine. Everything's great. You can see that the customer has a string name and it's being type checked. So I misspelled name 
here. So we'll run it. And you see I get an error saying that this is not defined. It's undeclared because I misspelled it. It's got two A's in it. Uh, again, let me, there we go, sorry. So, it's, so it's, it's, this was a pain point that a lot of people had. I personally didn't ha have an issue with it, but now this has been resolved. So a lot of, it's bring a lot of people in um, that were kind of wary of getting into Groovy because they really like the type checking. Do you have a question, Jay? I'm, I'm just, I'm admiring your, your, your turn, Mary. That's good. I assume that's what this is. Jammed into the... That's, um, that's the Elvis operator? Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, it's a shortened version of the Terminator. It first isn't defined, then it takes empty. Yeah, so if the first is defined, yeah. you get back first, otherwise you get empty. Right. Right, but this is basically a code block, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's why we're not used to that. So you can just do that inside Right here. But you have to import the. You have to, no, you don't have to import it. You just. This is the full path. I never do that inside metal codes. I've done it. Can I do that? I paged it because sometimes the interpreter screams out here. I wouldn't recommend it, even if it doesn't. So, I mean, it's been like 15 years since I worked on Perl. But that's how old Perl is. Um, I thought you could do that in Perl. I thought, I mean, I mean, do you, are you thinking? I mean, don't people put expressions inside of strings all the time in Perl, or not? It does. Yeah. I mean, it does variable interpolation. Okay. It does variable interpolation. Just not expression. But not, but not, but not expressions. Right. So, I, mean, okay. I think there may be a way to okay. do it, but I'm not. Okay. Can't say offhand. It wouldn't at all surprise me that that works in Perl. I mean. It never surprises me yeah. when things work. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm showing I'm showing both versions here. Um, this wouldn't work if I had just done the dollar sign in the variable because it would just do the first part of it. Right. So, but yeah, the the brackets allow for right. the expression to be put in there. I, I would never write code like that, even if it was syntactic. Because I, you know, two hours later I wouldn't remember. <laughs> change that. What do you mean you wouldn't remember what you did? So that it wasn't a string type or something? Is that when people would error out? Well, what would error out? No. It wouldn't error it out. Well, it's not a... It's, it's converting whatever it is. This isn't a string. If I put a number in there, it'll be the number one. Are you talking about the compile static string? Oh, because no, it no. I could I could certainly return back a string here and say name. You know, uh, name's a string at the top, so it's going to grab that and say hi, and it'll still it'll still not work because name is not it's not anywhere. Yeah, hasn't been defined. So. It's not that I was just putting in a string because the return type was coming That's back to the string. That's actually a pretty advanced detection. Yeah. I think. I mean, so you would ex I kind of would expect it to catch name like that, but inside of an expression, inside of a string, might be a little bit harder for the the compiler to type check. But certainly, some sophistication is is in a lot of thought. Like in that next down here. Here, yeah. You put like an extra S in last. Yeah. So No, it will. Uh there's name and there's last. So it caught both of them. In in Java J, you know, this this kind of if I have something giving me it, otherwise give me a default value. It seems like I end up doing that all the time. And so, I say, so when I'm doing Groovy, this Elvis operator syntax here, I mean, you get used to, I mean, you read that, it, it just becomes as fluent as anything. Yeah, it becomes idiomatic. I mean, yeah. The question mark colon is Elvis operator? Yeah. 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 So it's, it's all crammed together. So yeah. that's essentially what it should it look like. Yeah. 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 yeah, but that kind of thing, 
it, it, yeah, I do it all the time. But you'd stick like full and quotes in front of the colon, right? That's a ternary operator. But right? all that means, right, is that you use the value that's in first or you use the string in B, right? There's right. Else in there. It's just like using a four or something in, in or a shell. Yeah, I mean, essentially, because what happens is. Uh, yes. Yeah, because the first, actually, what happens is it evaluates first through the truthiness. Is you know anything that's false or null evaluates to false. So if, if so, this is the same statement. It doesn't have to be in a string. It's just if first was empty or null, then it evaluates to false, and you, you can execute stick, the false part you of that. Stick no quote not empty. Yeah, right you can, there, yeah, right? exactly. It's a ternary operator. Yeah, <laughs> except you, you know. I never heard of all this. Well, it's not. Well, no, because, because there are two different, different operators. So you couldn't have like first option is an optional. Yeah. You could do this too. This is a separate. Yes. I mean, because we do this, we do this everywhere. Where we'll say, you know, if first exists, then give me it. Otherwise, something else. This is just a, a shorthand way to not have to type the same thing over and over again. So if this exists, take it. Else, get the next value. Yeah. <laughs> conceptually, it's the same. Right. Conceptually, it's the same, but it's not the same operator. Right. Because on the ternary operator, it's not optional. You can't omit that. Yeah. You have to have all. Three, you have to supply all three values. Yeah, so you couldn't have a space in there. They'd be mad about that. Yeah. Question mark. So yeah. Values. So curl five ten. That's. Five, five, it is just a clever shortening. Yeah. It's, it's nice. Yeah. I like it a lot. No, they, yeah. they never yeah. change anything in Perl. They just add more shit. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that 5 5 pixels or 4 yeah. slash 4 slash Yeah, I think that's so that. Yeah, I've used that a few times. Yeah, yeah. No, it's nice. It, it is. Yeah. <laughs> but we don't have yeah. the Elvis operator. Perl doesn't have Elvis, does it? No, but that's basically what the yeah. double type people are just. Yeah. So we'll, we'll do two more examples here. We've got expando meta class, which I created this class lemming, which knows how to walk. Um, create expando meta class on lemming and assign it here for EMC, expando meta class. And then I add dig to it. This is another way to do dynamic stuff with an object. I'll add dig to this EMC. I'll initialize it. I'll create a regular lemming, and then I'll create the important lemming, which is still, they're still using the same base class. The important lemming can walk, because that's what I put here at the top, walk. Regular only knows how to walk, though. He can't dig. So this, this will have an exemption and say, hey, I don't know how to dig. So now the important lem lemming is going to dig, and he's digging, and he can walk. Now where that comes into play here is that I grabbed the important lemmings meta class and gave it the expando meta class, which we, as you saw here, he's digging. So you can see that he can't dig, and then you can see that there was no issue here with walking towards doom. So this is just another way to add dynamic properties to a class. And what's really cool with the meta, the expando meta class I've seen is there, I believe it's with this class where someone had a spreadsheet of data, like cars or something, and they put it in a CSV and they created instances of cars based on the columns. So let's say you were doing cars and you had model number, miles driven, that sort of thing. Well, you could create, based on feeding that to the expando meta class, you could actually create the, that class by reading the file and then doing your manipulation that way. So there's some really cool things you can do. Um, not that it's specific to Groovy, but just some things that I've come across recently as I was trying to put this talk together. And the last thing I'll show, um, for examples, is command chaining. Oh, I'll show some uh, ext an extension module too. But command chaining is a way to create a domain-specific language. And this, these things are kind of some syntactic stuff that I put in there in order to, to create what I want. So right here, find all people with active permissions. That's groovy code. That will run. 
notice that there's no punctuation or anything well this is this is the, the, what kicks it off find all is been defined here as a static I'm importing all these here essentially these are my token keywords so find will take quantity which is all in this case and then it'll have a people property because what gets returned back is a map this might blow some minds because it's kind of crazy and then it takes words w and I'm typing it here to kind of express what I want to happen with so as we walk through you can see find all people and you start seeing the chain with with is one of the words and it shows there words is taken here active is right here active takes words so permission is one of those words and then that's the end of the chain so I'm just going to print line fetching your report it could be whatever the code is that you wanted for for that specific domain language domain specific language um, did you want to talk about it? you've you've created one before I thought not maybe not with command line chaining no. but okay so I'll run it and you'll see fetching a report came twice. One was for this line here. And if you wanted to put all the punctuation in there, you can, it essentially evaluates to this. Fetch all people with active permission. What, what did you have to import or whatever These here, these are enums, these are, this is a Java concept, enumerables. And if you, if you import them here as static, then it, it becomes available to the to the rest of the script. So I'm, I created these. It's not that I imported them outside of the project. That's pretty cool. Yeah. 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 Is there any way to have that say delete all users from table? Yeah. And have it be dangerous, or is that you could do whatever you'd like. So I would define another one, call it delete. And it could, instead of saying find all, we say delete all people with active permission. And it should be okay. Oops, let me spell delete correctly. So if we copy this, it's going to say, let's just say deleting. It should be, should be fine here. Oh, thank you. Deleting your report. What is the, uh, what is, <laughs> what is print line, tick tick, and then a code return, and then tick tick do? So I'm printing, I'm printing the line here, okay. and I'm returning back this string. Oh. So the last thing executed, if, here, so the last thing executed gets returned. I could put return in there, but I don't want to. Okay. So that reads a little bit better, I guess. And I believe that was all the examples I, I had. For, oh, um, so we'll jump over to here. So my blog. Does anyone use DSLs? Yes. Did you get, where, where do you use Oh, do I use it personally? No, like, is there, are there large companies using DSLs, like, hardcore? I, yeah. So, well. I don't know any companies that actually. So for testing, DSLs are used a lot. Um, like Spock, when it, with those expect and all those sorts of things, those are all domain. Those are all DSLs. Yeah. So for the projects I've worked on, um, we haven't created custom DSLs, and the reason why we haven't is um, being being able to just use object.property along with the rich collection classes. And the, the, the collection classes almost read like a DSL for the things we've been trying to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got a, you know people as a collection, right? I want to go people dot each, whatever I'm going to, then I'll do person, person dot, you know, age, or, you know, some uh, some multiplier equals person, look up, you know, do a lookup, or whatever it is. But, you know, the, the syntax is so concise, and the, and the collection classes are so rich that we didn't, you know, on the projects I've worked on, we haven't really had the need so, to, to go create a customer. Yeah. So yes. for us, we, as a team, we don't need it, but what, I'd like to see happen is for our customers who aren't programmers 
to be able to use it. So we've got some application that we would like to have. Uh, I believe David talked about one where he was working with a finance company. And so for those experts that talked in terms of their financial, you know, financial vo vernacular or their, how their wording is, you can create the DSL so it matches what they expect when they say the things that they're saying so they don't have to learn how to write the Groovy code. DSLs, yeah. I've never heard that, yes, we use them and they actually work and we're happy. So I use them for my personal projects. I've got an email DSL that I created and I can show you that where I can just type in find all emails and that sort of thing. You presented that last week. That was using uh, Clojure and so I rewrote it using Groovy. Oh, same, okay. same concept. Yeah, yeah. But um, I use them personally. We just haven't did it for a client yet. Hoping to. I've got some things that with working with databases, I'd like to incorporate the DSL. Yeah. So to answer your question, no, we don't have anything that's using it to that level. Essentially, like, like, like you said, our code it lends itself to being rich enough that we don't have to create the, the, abstract, yeah. the abstraction. So there's two other things that we can quick, this is the map reduce and filter that I talked about earlier, and I added that with an extension module. And I've got a, a little write up here that gives some references of where, where I came to find how to do all these things. And I'll just show the snippets on GitHub so that it makes more sense. Okay. I'll show you the test. Can you that Apple false? Yep, yep. So I'm adding filter map and reduce. And I, I do two different versions of Reduce, and I'll show the tests for those. And you can see I'm using grep because it's expecting, it's expecting a collection, and this is part of the collection class. And then I do the same thing with map, collect. So it's just I'm just aliasing, essentially. That's conceptually, I'm just aliasing. I'm using the built-in name, the built-in methods that are already defined. And like I said, map makes more sense to me than collected, coming from a functional or having more been exposed to the functional side first. Reduce is essentially inject. So I'm defining all these things and um, putting it into an extension module, which will augment Groovy core at the compile level, not at runtime, which I showed earlier with the dynamic sorts of things. This is still adding behavior, but this is at, at a, a much deeper level. So what, what does this mean? This is just, this is defined, has defined all of that. So we'll run to the test. So this class, sorry, go ahead. So the class is defining um, kind of a set of static methods? Yes, okay. yes, just, yep. That's all it is. Okay. And so we'll go to test. And, okay. Again, I'm using the Spock framework for the test. So I'm gonna test map, just multiply, multiply it, and it's the same as to collect, just showing that, that they're the same thing. Reducing using multiplication, I used the string. Um, just, it was the easiest way for me to just get this implemented and, and proof of concept. So here I'm reducing and then multiplying. Can you go to the top? Uh, yep. So let's see here. So, uh, your, your, the class that's under test, how, how, let's see. how did you, how did the extension get folded during compilation? Oh, you want to go to resources. You have to have this file to work the magic and it has to be in this directory, okay. this meta. -in. So services, and here is the actual, this is all you need these three lines and your code, and you can create an extension too, which is sweet. Okay. So that, that's how it all gets wired up. And we'll go back to the test. Okay. And then... Yes. And this is all the reduced stuff. So here I'm applying plus to everything and you can see I'm getting 10 because it adds everything.
stuff. These are all the test cases. So this was, I had two versions of reduce that took these values. And you can see here, I can pass in my own closure and have it do the same thing. Can you go back to your extension module? Yeah, you want me to, to uh, the code you mean? Yeah. Let's just open a new window so we can flip back and forth. Um, main Groovy. Um, did I kill the Wi-Fi? I guess I did. Let's do this because I have it right here. Okay, so here's the code here. Let's see. So the methods. Um, here's the one that takes the closure here. And it knows to add these to a collection. Because I'm defining it here. But object is everything, so reduce theoretically would work on okay. all of them. Anything, okay. anything, right. anything Also the type, well, I assume it's the type and the... Yeah. Well, that's the return type, right? Right, so it's coming in as a collection, see? It's, these are the, this is what's getting okay. passed, the collection and then the operator. Okay. All right. Wow. So that, so these are all adding these methods. They're, they're adding methods to the collection class, not the object. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so let's go back to the testing. And I believe, yep, okay, so that's the extension module. And just my blog on that with the, with the source code linked. And now, so invoke, this will just be a brief discussion. Java has now allow, uh, incorporated invoke dynamic support. So all of the languages that dynamic languages essentially get a boost in, in speed. That's the promise. So JRuby, um, some of anything that essentially anything can t utilize this if it runs on the JVM. So, but in order to, to use it with Groovy, they've compiled two libraries, which is one is the indie jar and you get the regular jar. So you don't get it by default because a lot of folks still haven't migrated to the latest version of Java, which will support this. So I've got just a quick write up on how to, how I got it to work, you know, fairly quickly. So that, that's what's there. And that's all the indie, the invoke dynamic support was. That's just, you know, I said it in the slides, I said I'd briefly cover it and I mean, that's all there is. It gives you a performance increase in some areas. They're still working on it. Um, performance increase to, to the point that it's, in some cases, it's close to Java performance and speed, which is really, really cool. See, I've never had a problem with speed before, but knowing that I could, I'm not going to get that as an argument of a detractor of using Groovy, it's like, okay, great. It's, and that may apply to other languages that are running on the JVM too, that now they're being able to utilize the the speed of uh, the JVM. So let's get back okay. here. Okay, so we covered all these. These are some of the bigger projects. There's a ton of Groovy projects or Groovy based projects out there. Gradle's a build framework. Grails being the MVC, Griffon, and GVM. What's that? Some random thoughts, I've got some links to Project Coin um, that talks about some of the syntax and some of the things that were added and cleaned up. Um, binary notation, being, you know, being able to assign with that. Um, some formatting, double long. Um, whoa, whoa, what does that underscore notation mean if it's not in sets of three? And, and here? You're talking about here? Down two lines. This one? Yeah. 
I, I think they're just basically ignored, right? You can use them to delimit any way you want. Yeah. It just means the resultant number is not. It's oh. just for shorthand. The computer doesn't give it that. Yeah. Much. Okay. It's just for niceties and. Yeah. yeah. Still with humans. <laughs> <laughs> Multi catch. So you can put multiple catches in the. Or exception. How? What do you want to catch in the exception here? Um, okay. Vertex, like Node, but better. <laughs> Trolling a little bit here. <laughs> this is the asynchronous project here. It's, and you can use JavaScript, Ruby, Python, Groovy, or Java. They're all pretty concise. What, Groovy looks to be the, the shortest code, you know, lines of code. Can say the best. Yeah, it's the best. I'll say it. <laughs> I've got I've got a just a personal project that's using it. I abstracted that email program to use Vertex, so Vertex will sit and take commands, and it'll actually run it. So the idea is that I'll keep Vertex around for more than just this email project. But as I start adding functionality to to the programs that I'm working on, it will handle all those requests, and then pass them out. It'll farm out the work to to whichever, whichever code I want it to handle it. Uh, so, Groove script seems like nowadays if you don't have a, if your language doesn't convert to JavaScript, um, then you're just not hip anymore. So there's, there's that ability. Not, I'm not knocking this, it just seems like everyone that promotes JavaScript, then, then you've got everyone else saying, well, no, well, let's create our own, using our own language that compiles down to JavaScript. So it's just kind of funny what's happening in JavaScript world. It seems to me that it's becoming the new JVM, where everyone loves the engine it's using, but necessarily the, the actual language. Yeah. And then GPARs, built-in concurrency. This is really, really nice for doing parallel uh, concurrent computing. And I don't... No, the link will work here. This is built into to Groovy. I've used this for downloading like images, and it's real easy. You just use the collection that you saw earlier, but you can put in how many how many threads you want it to work with by just as a parameter, and it'll do all the work for you. So I was downloading images for uh, my movie library that I had compiled, and when I did it serially, it was taking just an unreal amount of time and then I put I used GPARs put 10 threads on it and it was pull, I was done within 10 minutes because I was able to pull all that stuff down and it's really stable I haven't seen much issues with it if any at all uh, so supports all of these all the things that you think of in other languages actors fork join agents STM, if you're doing anything with concurrency, I, I would say take a look at using GPARs. That's really all I have to talk about. Summary, Groovy Rocks. I hope that if you weren't interested before or had no idea this at least piqued some interest or maybe some things that you saw that Groovy can do that you'll take back to your communities implement them or just find out about them. That's the best way that I've learned is from other talks and other languages and seeing if Groovy had it or whichever language I was using, using it. It's got a great community. It's very active. It's not a whole lot of, I can't say that I've seen any egos being thrown around. So it's really, really a humble, I think a real humble group that just want to get things done. And there's, like I said, no egos or really, I haven't seen much negativity Everyone's pretty. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of the most user friendly communities I've seen. So that's all I have. If there's any further questions.